Okay. We're going live. Good. <clears throat> Okay. okay, we're live. Okay. Good. So, um, and action. Action. Um, uh, uh, please Lunch, stop. Launching. So, yes, yeah, stop sharing by now that I, I will make my introduction. Okay. And then you can share again. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, um, Okay, this is uh, our uh, webinar. Uh, the, the title is Human in Cage, and the lecturer is uh, Einar Larsen. Um, I'm sorry that our beautiful uh, 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 con conductor, uh, Sabine Heinz, is not with us uh, this, this night uh, uh, because she's having serious uh, family issues. Therefore, I will. Uh, uh, do her part in uh, okay I'm not so nice as he is but however <laughs> <laughs> okay <Yeah. laughs> try to survive <laughs> do this thing uh, so first of all I will introduce Bernard Foyne that is the space renaissance uh, uh, president we elected him in during our last uh, congress uh, in in July and uh, he is back uh, yesterday from Dubai at the International Astronautical Federation uh, Congress. Uh, by the way, I was there too, only for three days, presenting uh, three papers and so on. We made a lot of work. We had a lot of meeting uh, and uh, with a um, lot of people, they were enthusiastic about the space renaissance. And uh, I think we will see another big season of growth for our movement and our association. Thanks, thanks to the great work that Bernard is doing. Uh, so, uh, Bernard, if you yeah. like to say okay, so, words about that. Yes, or... so welcome everybody. So, okay, thanks uh, uh, Sabine uh, for organizing this uh, Space Renaissance webinar where we have a, a quite a comprehensive program. Uh, so typically uh, twice uh, per month and you can see on our website what is a program. Indeed, we are just coming back uh, with uh, Adriano Otino, so our ambassador and founder of Space Renaissance International. We are coming back from Dubai, where there was an International Astronomical Congress. They were on a time back from pandemics, more than 5,000 participants in presence uh, registered, but we had also a large participation all over uh, from the, the public. And we have been a part of a number of uh, session, we orga I organized the one on space exploration symposium. So uh, going to the moon, Mars, uh, the inner solar system, the outer solar system. We had uh, also some very interesting uh, uh, session uh, we, about uh, uh, building a session in geostationary orbit. We had also a session on space food. I'm becoming an expert on space food. And for this, we called on the panel, the very famous uh, uh, cook, Martha Stewart. She came here to give us some hints how we can eventually uh, use some of the development from food in space to develop as well techniques for solving problem of food on Earth. So clearly making a very strong connection between space and Earth, but also our message is uh, what that we need to expand. So expand uh, uh, into uh, uh, to inspire the, the, the people, to educate them, to create uh, also some uh, uh, future for everybody, even to survive. And that's the object of Space Renaissance, with a very strong part played uh, by uh, humanities and uh, uh, by uh, thinking. I'm also from the other side, very interested in developing uh, how to integrate the technology, the science in our culture in order to uh, go to, for this space renaissance. So now, in this uh, vein, clearly, we are very happy to have Anna Larson. And now I give back the floor to Adriano to introduce uh, our speaker, where we have a, a short video of introduction. And so all the best to everybody. Yes. Uh, 
Thank you, Bernard. Now I will say a few things about who is uh, uh, Einar. Einar is a Norwegian author, a graphic designer by profession and an astronomic art artist. He found a science book in the forest when he was five and <laughs> let and uh, let go ever since. Uh, so the, uh, <clears throat> the Einar art is painting and visual art, writing poems and prose. What inspired him most in his artistic work, work was the beauty, the, the mystery, and the majesty of the universe. The space exploration, space settlement, expanding civilization into space, moon, Mars, asteroids, and beyond. Gerard on a big rotating orbital towns, the natural beauty of planet Earth and other planets, humans, the people of planet Earth, his dreams and imagination. So uh, this is the guy that we present now, will give us uh, his uh, lecture. He is uh, also the author of a book titled Mr. No Brain. And uh, uh, so, okay, the floor is your, Einar, please. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, then we start. Welcome, everyone. <clears throat> no matter where on the planet you are, you are all in the same cage anyway. <laughs> Thanks to all the faith environmentalists have to set it that way. Uh, well, in this show, I will explain everything based on my book, Mr. No Brain and the environment. And this is actually a very serious case. Uh, I will make this, uh, we'll make this into three parts. In part one, I will tell you why I decided to write this book and uh, what it's all about. In part two, I will tell you what I have done so far to let the world, whole world know about uh, the book and what I'm doing, the response I got. And uh, since most people like stories with a happy ending, part three will be about how we can get out of the cage and how we can solve the problem. So let's start with part one. Uh, first of all, I, will, I uh, want to introduce Mother Earth. Uh, she stay by my side here, uh, Mother Earth. They are waiting for you now. Oh, there she is, Mother Earth. She looks good for her age, uh, and uh, she's a very friendly lady, but uh, she don't like anyone who abuse her, just for to say that. It's very hard for me to say uh, exactly when uh, I start to look at the star for the first time, the first star I see, I don't know which star that was, uh, but I can't remember anything that made me more excited than the night sky. My intense interest in astronomy started when I was four. It's a little wrong information in my homepage. It's five, uh, five years old. I started actually when I was four, but it's not important. Um, and all the talking from adults around me about environmental problems was something I find very strange. Because I knew that the environment was not just the planet, Uh, but uh, yes, Mother Earth, I agree with you. Uh, uh, everybody should know this thing. Uh, everybody should know it. I was thinking to write a book, but uh, why should I do it if everybody understood it? Because nothing was more abused for me. But uh, no one uh, seems to understand anything. And after Apollo, uh, space age uh, began to fade. Year, the year went by, uh, but I still didn't write the book. I was convinced 
that people would pick up sooner or later. But after many years, I become very mad and I write a book. And finally, Mother Earth get the help she deserved. And I will never forget how happy she was. The idea of the book was very simple. I create a fictional uh, character uh, as uh, Mr. Nobre. I come for the behavior to the world's environmentalist. He's a guy who lives with his family in a rich landscape, never go out of the house because he means that fixing the environmental uh, situation in his house, in his home, means to stay inside and never open the door at all. He ignore all the help that's right outside the door waiting for him. Just in the same way uh, that environmentalists ignore all the permanent environmental solutions that the landscape outside Earth has to offer. And they only stay inside in the little tiny home we have where they have caged us all. Mother Earth, uh, actually for to tell you first, uh, you see the table here, all the delicacies that can help Mother Earth's health and uh, solve the whole problem have been there all the time, but they, uh, they refuse to see it actually. And that's the sad case. The Earth expect them to see it, but they behave like immature babies. Hmm. Here is a cartoon from my book that shows Mr. Nobrain's basic philosophy. I hope you can read it all a little bit next. Well, uh, Mother Earth, this is very serious, so you don't need to laugh, this is serious, because they don't understand anything at all. Oh, Mother Earth, everything will be fine. Don't cry, don't cry. We, we just have to work even harder. Uh, we'll go to part two, uh, if we can go closer to the happy ending. Here we should take a look at what Mother Earth and me have done so far. Yes, we have been working really hard. In addition to my extreme disappointment that people have never listened to me through my childhood, and not even uh, after the publish, uh, publication of my book, I, uh, I have sent out, let me see, I clicked the right way here. I have sent out more than 1,000 emails to the press, TV, and radio in all English speaking and Scandinavian speaking countries. The book is available in both English and Norwegian. 28 of the world's largest environmental organizations have also heard from me. And uh, of course, I try to have a dialogue with local organizations here in Norway. And I also, I also made uh, six environmental videos that can be found on YouTube. And I posted more than thousand memes on social memes around uh, social medias, countless of time. And I offered actually Norwegian schools, free lecture, especially in a connection with 
what I call the tragic development of the environmental soap opera after Greta Thunberg become the new central actress. And uh, during the work on the book, after this its publication, I have visited 42 countries and talked talk about the environmental situation and what I'm doing to, to normal people around. So far, uh, <laughs> uh, no one has been contacting me and that's, that tells a lot. They do not understand anything of what I'm saying or they choose total silence probably because environmental, environmental problems are big business. Don't talk about space, stay in the cage. Still, even today, the younger generation lacks good knowledge. For the most, they know almost nothing. Even in scientific programs, we see that space is presented uh, like we should never even think about the wicked space at all. Weightless, weightlessness, uh, a life we did gra without gravity, uh, is very dangerous and will turn your, uh, your body into a jelly doll. And we should give the dirty work of exploring Mars and other worlds to the robots. Why do they say dirty work? <laughs> I don't look at that as a dirty work. It's terrible, dangerous to land there. There are rocks everywhere around. And that rocks will destroy your billion spaceship and lead to your certain death. The Martian landscape is hostile and terrible. Oh, that little bit too fast. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Scientists, uh, and you will face a cruel death, they use the sound. If you take off your helmet. What kind of idiotic warning? <laughs> Who wants to take off the helmet anyway? Scientists who talk like this, they are just the same headless as people who try to scare the, the crap of the, the crew on the old sailing ships in the past. I cannot see any difference. I would like to see them take off their, all their clothes here in Norway, a cold January day in minus 40 degrees Celsius and see if they survive it. How stupid is it actually possible to be? I don't know if uh, everybody, all of you think about it, but it's not easy to find place even here on Earth where we don't need any kind of protection at all against cold or dangerous solar radiation. We do not call it spacesuit. Why? Because we are on Earth. Okay. Even when uh, we are going to land on Mars with people for the first time, people will for sure call it spacesuits. Uh, what's the difference? Is it the helmet that's missing? Huh. Well, it's not that different. Sometimes it's so hard to breathe there not uh, especially in, in the winter time. So everyone cannot actually stay outside because of their health situation. And if you dress, if you don't dress properly, 
uh, I can uh, I can tell you that uh, there might be the last outside adventure you ever will get. Elsewhere on the planet, the heat can raise to over 40 degrees plus. And then we often choose to modify the climate around us. You can actually call it a kind of uh, terrifying, terraforming. <laughs> uh, Constant cooling may be necessary to avoid heat stroke, actually even in the night. This has nothing to do with global warming. Well, that is the way planets are. Uh, Other Earth, it's not your fault. That's the way your body works. So we have how to accept that. Even uh, everyone who work with environmental issues agree that the Earth is our home. But when, when I claim that uh, they also must treat Mother Earth like they do with their own private house, they go out and uh, not over explode her and not over explode your home either. They become silent, very silent. She have been taking care of us, Mother Earth have been taking care of us now for uh, thousands of years and show us all the good things and now he must continue to live with the fact that people who said they love her, in fact, only continue to abuse her. And that's really sad. What have dogs to do with these things? Well, <laughs> I can tell you that even dogs, they know that the home is not a place to stay 24 hours a day. 365 days a year. The house is a place we live and no one do everything indoors in the house. The style of our home is not important thing. Just that you respect your home. And uh, the size and the location is not important either. And a large house only gives you the opportunity to stay longer indoors if you want. That means that even a castle is not a home you can use as a beach. If you don't go out for to help the castles in, uh, environmental insight to keep, for to keep the environmental situation in a good condition and give the castle protection, you will not have a safe living even in a castle. The rules also apply to Well, what should I say? Of course, Prince William know all this. But it looks like he don't want the whole, the entire humanity to be in a good condition. He complained of our greatest environmental heroes who do the best they can protect the Mother Earth. Support the world's environmentalists to make uh, our Earth into a cage and not a home. Here we live in a giant cage guarded by Mr. Nobrain's family. 
instead of having the opportunity to come out, giving Mother Earth the protection, protection and service she deserves, and find more, so we can find more place also to live for our race. I feel that Prince William won Mother Earth to suffer without all these good things. Mother Earth, are you there? Mother Earth? Oh. Uh -huh. I understand your panic. We have soon 8 billion people, I will call them babies, here on Earth. And none of them seem to grow up. What are we going to do, Mother Earth? Prince William, if you hear me, I would like to know how you provide service and protection for your royal home without getting assistance from the outside environment. And please tell me if you also have a plan to donate some properties to your royal family or to save Mother Earth. Because as you said, the environment has to go first, right? Is it, or is all the royal family's property? And uh, one more thing, Prince William, you said we should not look so much up, we should look down. I cannot imagine a more destructive, destructive statement. And now it comes from Prince. I can prove that you said it, as it was, it's been deleted from videos from your interview, but many people have seen it and heard it together with me. Well, Mother Earth, what do you think about, <laughs> think about Prince William? Oh, <laughs> you really said it best, Mother Earth, by said nothing. I think we want to go to the, the best part here. We go to part three, and uh, it's time to move toward a happy ending. Do so. In the word the right way here. Yes, it, it does. Um, only in a while, Mr. No Brain peeks out of out the window between the curtains, but only for a few seconds just to convince himself that everything out there is completely meaningless for him. Then he blamed himself for wasting time, time he could spend for something more important, for example, sweeping more dust under the rug. If the human race want to survive, we need to look more, far more out of the big windows to our plan. Actually, it's not an option, something we need to do. The, big, the biggest environmental threat is out there and we need an advanced establishment in space to protect the planet for our future. Some day look at Jupiter as our security, like the planet, but regarding Jupiter as a great security guard due to its size and gravitational force is a myth that uh, puts a break on realization of interplanetary base. A planet of that size do so much more than a wall of objects. They also change and disrupt, disrupt, disrupt ob, uh, orbits of asteroids and comets as well. Jupiter can therefore 
just as uh, as easily lead objects toward us. And just think about if you have a giant security guard moving at the speed of a turtle on one side of your castle, while a thief break through the door the opposite, then he cannot help you. And in our solar system, where we have the, the sun and three planets, in between sometimes uh, our planet and Jupiter, then Jupiter become a very small comfort. Jupiter can't just speed up and uh, help us uh, on the opposite side. Undiscovered objects are the most dangerous and the best defense against them are bases, different places, places in the solar system. Because it's important to change their curves far away from, from Earth actually possible when the speed are much lower because when they are more far from the sun, lower and they speed up more and more how more they come. The art you see here is my own art and uh, shows an Earth-like planet in another solar system getting the first impact from a twin asteroid. Hopefully, we will have the outpost we need before it's too late. But the fact is that we have no defense at all today. And we have a miserable control situation. In fact, the tragedy may happen anytime without any warning at all. But of course, uh, environmentalists like Mr. Nobre is concerned about more important. Oh, Mother Earth, don't be that angry. They will figure it out. Sooner or later, it's just a matter of time, okay? People who believe they can uh, uh, manage all the environmental problems under the roof of Earth, they follow Mr. Nobrain's philosophy, which will never lead to anything else than a total environmental collapse. and reduce people's freedom and joy. Environmental problems is actually, or not, yes, environmental problems in general, I, I can say it that way, is a very misunderstood concept. As you can see here, out of. All environmental problems can be solved without the need to reduce our quality of life. We always hear that we have to save and all that. We don't really need it. We have everything we need. So if we stop the, the cage mentality, everything will be. Global warming is probably the hottest topic in the environmental context of our time. But the sun itself is very little mentioned. I did not travel to Hungary in 1999 to convince myself that a solar eclipse is cooling the planet. Of course, I knew that already. I uh, went there uh, for to experience the beautiful events. Environmentalists, on the other hand, uh, do not seem to understand simple and natural uh, 
temperature adjustment a shadow can, can make. If the moon, uh, if the moon's orbit had given us a total solar, solar eclipse every single month, they would probably complain global cooling instead. But uh, it's uh, precisely uh, the knowledge of this that can solve everything. Also other problems uh, when uh, environment, because there is many, many different uh, problems uh, we have to solve. And again, we have to operate in space, or of course we have to operate. This is a dream place for real environmentalists. But don't worry, we are not going to build something that covers the entire solar disk. We know that only small adjustments provide the effects needed. And uh, that applies to both cooling and heating. The adjustment, uh, the mega construction uh, that we can see here being built is a, a adjustable multifunctional system that reduces the sun's effect on Earth or increases it by reflection. And at the same time, uh, works a giant power plant. Adjustable modules have solar panels on one side and mirror surface on the other side. Here we see two astronauts, not four, inspecting the unit, one unit uh, on the mirror side. And just in seconds, at least a minute, uh, the, the mirror effect can also give us a unique help during crisis on Earth at night and give some small, tiny, artificial suns, but strong enough, uh, enough to light up good so we can see very well. And that can save millions of people's lives. And uh, this kind of uh, artificial suns can reach anywhere on Earth or in orbit if it's needed. Then we solve many problems, and uh, you see, Mother Earth, she gets sunglasses. <laughs> and uh, a jacket instead of an ice age. That's nice. She's so very, she's so very sweet, that lady. But by the way, uh, if anyone now uh, might think that everything we need for to do all this thing must be sent up to space with millions of the rocket launches, then you are happily wrong. We have a uh, more resources in space than we can find on our own planet. It's about time that we stop torturing Mother Earth. Only environmentalists like Mr. No Brain's family find search solutions. And we see it here in a new cargo. Oh, Mother Earth, don't be that mad, okay? I understand your frustration. Uh, well, uh, that means that we, we can uh, also re remove uh, a lot of uh, pollution from the planet. Uh, Mother Earth, I think everybody understands you, okay? Mm. That means that we can remo remove a lot of uh, industry from the Earth and place it into space. And we can do it more, far more organized 
and we even do it here on the planet. All west can be sent to the most perfect landfill in the solar system, the sun itself. Just for to tell you the details around all these things, you can read about it in my book, but here I take it just uh, very, very easily. Yeah, um, this picture shows uh, just an example that uh, the transportation uh, makes also a lot of pollution. And if we have the factory in space and uh, products can be delivered anywhere on Earth from a factory, factories uh, located in the polar orbit without harming the planet. So uh, that's why uh, even the transportation around on the, on the sea and on the land can be almost away. And then Mother Earth will once again shine as a paradise. Mother Earth will be and never more become polluted as before. But Mother Earth, what are we going to do with the overpopulation? Well, um, we have some solution, don't we? The space tourism will uh, change a lot as uh, more and more people will experience the beauty of Mother Earth. I agree about that. No? And uh, get more conscious relationship to the full extent of the environment, right? You are agree with me? So, I don't think there's anything to worry about. We, we can uh, expand the human territory and build habitats. This is not only, uh, this will not only give space for billions of people, but also help uh, conserving plants and animal species. This is a unique solution known as O'Neill cylinders after the creator of the idea, Jared Kitchen O'Neill. These kind of beautiful small words make it harder ever to keep alive the claim that planet B does exist. Of course, they are not planets, but uh, since, uh, but nice places to live, uh, where the environment can be fully adjusted and uh, where everyone have an easy access to space it's very easy for people who live there to come to space and look at the beauty of space without any disturb disturbance from the atmosphere or anything. That's something actually I should show many examples of, but uh, everything takes time. Uh, what you see on this picture is not an O'Neill cylinder, it's something completely different. And uh, of course, uh, we have a lot of, um, uh, have a lot of, uh, side buildings of different uh, size and quality that assist our private homes. And this is just an example of a poor little, little thing. Uh, and uh, we're using them for to doing things we don't want to do exactly in the living room or the bedroom or the kitchen like that. And uh, there is planets where we can live in some sectors or possible terraform. All talking about that planet B does not exist is just a way to uh, preserve the old and the, uh, depressive cage culture. The best hope we have for a better future is that the new generation 
will understand more of the reality around us. Yeah, here is what my uh, now five-year-old son said when he was three years old. Very proud of that boy, of course. I think I now will end with something, uh, something I really like. Uh, it's something uh, Arthur C. Clarke said. It's a very wise word. So I want to set that here in the end. He said, uh, an idea must go through three stages. First stage, it is impossible to carry out. Second stage, it is possible, but we cannot, we cannot do it because it's not profitable. Third stage, I knew all along that it was a good idea. The way the human are, it takes time. That's up. Well, Mother Earth, yes, uh, it's time for us to thank our wonderful audience. It was a, was a pleasure to share the time with all of you. So if uh, someone have uh, some question or comments, then we are actually ready. Okay. Einar, thank you very much for your beautiful presentation. And uh, uh, yes, if someone uh, 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 want to uh, to give some questions to Einar or comments, you can do it on the YouTube chat. Uh, by the way, I have uh, I have some some uh, uh, some thoughts that your uh, your lecture stimulated in me in me, and uh, I I particularly. Uh, like the metaphor of Mother Earth because it's very, uh, let me say, self-explanatory. So the the uh, the thing that I the thing that I I, I used several times is the metaphor of the pregnant Earth, and I wrote a book uh, uh, titled. Uh, Earth is not is not sick. She's pregnant because the humanity was grown up up to eight billion, almost eight billion uh, citizens right now, and it is time to have to give birth, or uh, Mother Earth could suffer. A, a, uh, how is this called an abortion and that would be terrible uh, please stop sharing screen stop uh, Einar, <laughs> stop sharing the screen so we can mother we, can we go we go away now mother Earth, okay but we, we will keep talking to mother earth of course <laughs> but, <laughs> of course we, yeah. we have to we have to so the, the, the uh, I think the most explicative uh, metaphor that we can use now, uh, talking about environmental environmental problems we have we are having on on uh, our mother planet, is that uh, the boys are grown up. They are they are standing in the house the whole time, and Mother Earth cannot make it anymore to make the uh, rooms clean. Mother Earth cannot make it anymore, uh, refreshing, getting fresh water, new fresh water, and to clean the air, and to keep the oceans uh, well uh, alive and oxygenated and so on. 
So Mother Earth is trying to rush us to go out. To when the boys are, are grown up, they have to uh, to go outside to find their own home, to make their life outside the the, the mother mother home. Of course, not everybody, not all the boys. Some boys will remain in home. Some some boys will go outside. But this solution that is the very solution of the environmental problems and not all not only the environmental problem because we also have big social problems that it is another issue that is very very big and and uh, we know that it is with the migrations and a lot of things and um, so this solution it is really incredible that we didn't listen to the word space in the G20 that is right uh, finished today in Rome. And they will not speak about space in the uh, COP26, COP26 that somebody, somebody already started to call FLOP26 because uh, uh, they refuse to think even about space only uh, about what space is already doing for Earth. That is the uh, the Earth, Earth observation monitoring satellites that are uh, working for the Earth environment, and maybe the only voice that we will heard in the COP twenty six will be from UK and maybe uh, India, because they will talk about they 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 are planning to talk about uh, uh, solar power uh, from space, so to to build. Uh, orbital uh, plants to, to collect solar, uh, solar uh, energy and transmit it, web, uh, transmit it uh, on Earth by micro, microwaves. Uh, so this will be the only, the only voice uh, talking maybe about space at COP26, but nobody uh, is uh, uh, daring to talk about the most simple solution of the earth uh, problems that will solve both environmental and social problems. Because uh, when, the, when the civilian space development will be uh, started, then there will be an economical revolution unprecedented and the global economy will start growing up at, uh, at uh, two figures. And uh, in the same time, with the time, of course, because it's not an immediate uh, process, uh, Earth, the Earth environment will be relieved from the burden of our industrial development. It is the plan of Jeff Bezos to move industries in the geolunar space and so on. So, uh, uh the question the real question is why why the earth uh, political uh, leaders are so scared about uh, the concept of going outside and starting the civilian space development i have to say that in, in dubai uh, at the uh, IAC Congress, uh, we, Bernard and myself, we found uh, quite another awareness of this thing, of the, 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 the urgency to start a civilian space development. But, but it, 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 it is incredible that uh, between the space community and the, the world leaders, uh, it seems to be a wall, a very thick wall that it, it, it doesn't allow the, uh, the, idea, the, the correct ideas to pass through. So I think your, your, your book, uh, Mr. No Brain, that I, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, read it yet, but I will, is quite uh, opportune and timely. And, and, uh, and we hope that uh, a lot of people will read it, and uh, uh, and 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 things can change because things should change before 2030. Otherwise, 
our window, launch window to step to the stars could, could be closed by heavy social, environmental, and, uh, and, and the, the, the many crises that we are already experimenting. Uh, okay, I don't know, maybe Bernard would like, would like to, to comment also that this is, uh, of course, this is uh, the key uh, uh, topic of, of these days. I would like to say something to you because um, you know, I'm very happy for to meet uh, these organizations because I didn't know anything that this organization exists before. <laughs> and uh, it's nice to meet people who understand what I understand and what I understood since I was four years old. I mean, this is, it's really hard. I can tell you, it's, it has been a, a really hard fight to, to tell this to people. And uh, when I'm talking to people look, uh, local here in Norway, uh, working with the environment, uh, I can tell it in details. I can feed them with teaspoons. And when I have done that, they still said the same thing that, yes, but we have to take care of the planet first. It's like they never heard anything of what I have been telling them. We cannot understand the similarity between a house and the landscape outside and the earth with the landscape outside the earth. It's actually the same thing. Uh, it's the same as you are in a house, you have a room, you wake up in a bedroom, you cannot stay there the whole day. You need to go to the kitchen, you have a living room, you have a bathroom, you need that. And you can go back to the bedroom you want again, but you can extend that all the time. And the earth is actually home, simple. And there is one thing you said, that why are the governments so afraid? It's not only the governments, it's people in general, all of them are afraid. And I can, uh, I think everybody's on my side if I say that the government, they are not more smart than the people who work in the street. The lady sitting in the cashier in the supermarket. I mean, they are not, definitely not. Because uh, I don't know who was the person, but there was a, a one in the US government some years ago. Uh, he said that uh, why should we go to Mars just for to prove that we can go there? Just for to prove that we can go there. Of course, we go there for other reasons. I don't think they see what is out there. They don't understand so much about space. The education is low. So even the people sitting in the government, their education, the place they That's my comment to, to what. Yeah, at the same time, we had uh, some comments from, from the audience. Uh, Daniel Tweed say, what is the best argument for space expansion to use with Earth-obsessed environmentalists? A space bird is better than an Earth miscarriage. Mother Earth wants us to move out of her basement so she can grow stuff in there. I love the idea of combining solar radiation management with space solar power. And uh, in space, there is no cage B. <laughs> yes, uh, the <laughs> cage B instead of planet B. Yeah. Uh, yes, what it this came to my mind is that, uh, of course, we need the planet B or more planet or the equivalent of, of many planets B. And the, the point is to, to, that the environmentalists uh, should, uh, should uh, become aware that we cannot say planet A if we will not get a planet B. Because we cannot, we cannot do it staying everybody here. That's the point that they, they don't want to understand. And, if, if, and they also don't understand that if we stay, stick on remaining closed in the boundaries of uh, uh, Mother Earth, uh, we are going toward a big, a very big Holocaust, because all the, uh, 
strategies to uh, solve the environmental problem staying on Earth only in closed on the closed system will not work for two reasons. The first one is that they are only passive strategies. We are, they are saying that we have to reduce our emissions of carbon dioxide. They say that we have to reduce our lifestyle, that we have to, to trash our industrial society without having nothing in replacement. So these are only passive strategies. We should adopt active strategies. The, the most, uh, uh, the first one is to start developing civilian space outside. But we also would have some uh, terrestrial strategies, very important, that would be active strategies. First of all, all technologies to absorb CO2, uh, they are developing some technologies to absorb CO2 from the air. That will, would uh, solve the problem of CO2. But if the sea is really rising up because of the global warming, then we should think about protecting the coastal uh, cities building dams like in, in, uh, they made in the Netherlands one, 100 years ago. So we, we, we don't have to invent anything new. We have just to repeat what the Netherlands people did to protect the coastal cities. We can also use the surplus of uh, water coming from the melting of the, uh, of the ice to claim the deserts. Uh, making new forests in the deserts. Forests will eat CO2. So there, is a, there are some active strategies that are not considered at all. And also, of course, uh, to, to use satellite technologies to, uh, according to what is the problem, if there is a, a a, a, a warming, we can shield, shield the, sun, uh, the sun, as you said in your, in your presentation, to, to, uh, to have some sh shadow and, uh, and lower the temperature. And if the problem will be uh, an icing, and uh, that some, some scientists say that, uh, that uh, we are going toward a, nice, a new ice, a small ice age, that it, it occurs every uh, some thousand years on, on our planet. Then we can use mirrors to, to reflect uh, uh, sunlight and uh, all, all of these things were already designed uh, 40, 50 years ago by Gerard Donnell, by Kraft Erike, by uh, scientists that in, in the 70s and 80s uh, wrote a lot on all of these things. So there's nothing to be to be invented. We just have to take those projects and develop. That's correct. That's correct. That, that's what I always have. This is, we use actually old technology. Many people asking me, how oh my God, how long time will this take? You are talking nonsense to build all, all these things. Oh my God, who is going to pay for it? How long time will it take? I just used to say that if People like you didn't talk in the same way for 50 years ago. That's the point here, because this is an old technology. We have a more higher technology today, but we land on the moon, we place three cars on the moon running around with electric cars on the moon, and we, done, we have done so many advanced things. And we spend a short time actually to, to reach that goal in the past. Amazing. And if we, if we didn't put a break on the space technology, not how this problem will be. And one more thing I just want to say. Uh, uh, maybe people sometimes feel that I expect too much, but 
I used to say, look at what the people use their time for, what they are interested in. Everybody is actually born as scientist. Everyone, I, I just see it on my son. I didn't inject the science into his blood. I could feel it, his question, his question all the time. And I stimulate him all the time. He was out, he looking up and I never make him afraid for the darkness. He liked to see the sky. Well, that's all it needs. I mean, I mean, if the new generation grow up, the world will expand with a, a generation, with a society, with a human, human race, with so much more interest of this that Elon Musk and uh, Bezos and uh, Richard Branson, they will not be the only one who spend money. For the whole world will do it and that will solve a lot of problems. We need more people. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. We have to grow. <laughs> yeah, yes. Because they said, I mean, they're complaining. They're spending billions for space tourists. So one thing that is really good with space tourists is just enjoy for, for rich people, okay? But you have to think about one thing. Uh, this, the first civilian uh, space activity actually now is for the, for the millionaires or, or billionaires. And one of the thing is that uh, as long as that is the beginning, space yeah. technology will be, will be developed so much more safe, will be so much more safe because if there is an accident, Everybody will hear about accident and the business will go down. So this, the, the quality of everything and the safety has to be so high. Of course, that is benefiting everything. Yeah, um, well, I think there are two, milestones, two key milestones in, in the civilian space development. The first one is occurring and it is the uh, reusability, the rockets reusability opens open the way to space tourism to first civilians to, to go out to space because the cost is is downsizing and therefore space tourism become feasible and the second the second milestone will be when uh, it will be possible to produce fuel in space from from moon resources or from asteroid resources that will be another step of downsizing of the cost of every missions. If you can refuel in orbit instead of bringing all the fuel from Earth, that would be grandiose. It, it would be the real start, uh, the development of industry, industrial development. So uh, we just have to support Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson and uh, this guy are these guys are working very much for uh, for the people of Earth and for the environment and for everything, very much more than the uh, leaders that are sitting uh, in these days. Uh, and and uh, uh, making a lot of words, okay? Greta Thunberg said, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. She okay, said yeah. a lot, the blah, blah, the blah, blah, she said, it's, it's, okay. it's the same blah, blah, the environmentalists have been saying for decades. There's nothing okay. new at all. Yes. But yes. there's one thing there's one thing I want to say to you now because you're talking about making fuel in space. This is important. If anyone going to Amazon, uh, there is a review of my book in Amazon. Everybody can read it. Um, it's a terrible review, but I'm really proud of it. I like it uh, that it's there because there was, was an American environmentalists accidentally he buy my book because he thought the book was another kind of environmental book and he is blaming me for to don't know anything about what I'm talking about by example telling that I said that we have to make uh, fuel in space out of rocks and <laughs> well in a way we can do it but the way he talk it's like uh, uh, now uh, the, the fact is that that guy know nothing about these things. But it's uh, it's a very negative review, but in the same time funny to read. So uh, I invite everyone to go there and read his his uh, review. 
Yeah, thanks God there are only rocks in, in space because yeah. So it's our duty to bring the life there. Yes. To 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 reproduce the Earth bioma on in in a solar system. Yeah, this is our. I think this is our uh, philosophical destiny, if you like. I have six videos on YouTube. One of the YouTube video, I think it's number four. Yeah, it's number four. What I think, I think Bernard four? want to say something. Is, yeah, is, uh... he's welcome. Okay, yeah, okay, so thank you very much, um, Anna. Um, indeed, uh, growing uh, in terms of population, but what is important is uh, uh, to give um, access to everybody to, to education so that everybody can grow also can grow and uh, be able to uh, uh, to develop, you know, uh, brilliant minds that are going to help us uh, uh, to go further. And uh, clearly, uh, I believe as well, uh, okay, space expansion, uh, so beyond uh, the material aspect of, uh, yes, uh, being able uh, to to go at, uh, to, uh, to, to have access to space at a low cost and, uh, be able uh, to harvest some of the resources uh, that we'll find on the moon, like uh, we have uh, found ice. There, what is very special is uh, we can uh, as well uh, uh, develop a new, uh, so a new culture out of, uh, take the best of what we have on, on Earth in terms of uh, uh, creativity. So I think that uh, the main resource, I believe that, uh, we can harvest uh, by uh, going to space is uh, developing uh, uh, human uh, creative minds. And, yeah. and uh, then they will be able to uh, help humanity also even help the whole biosphere. And so that's uh, how I see that uh, we have to realize our destiny uh, to, to go there. Um, also to develop, to go beyond ourselves. You know, there's something I like especially in our to say. I can I can talk here in our words. I'm not going to do that. But <laughs> there's one thing you said I really like. You're talking about to get a more creative mind because we heard people going to space, uh, astronauts from a classic uh, beginning, uh, classic time from the beginning of the space age, and uh, we see now uh, Captain Kirk <laughs> going to space. And one common thing they said uh, is that, oh, it was overwhelming. It was so fantastic. They, they get another view of the planet. Oh, it was enormous. And I think we should almost by force put some politicians and uh, environmentalists, even Christopher Thunberg, into a small spaceship and put them out in space for uh, some hours. <laughs> Maybe the <laughs> that's a joke uh, but what I want to say is that how more people go into space how more developed the humanity will be how more they will understand even when it comes to nations uh, to understand each other languages they will, you will look at that little blue marble and think what are we actually doing now no? one thing is to learn in the school that the, uh, the earth is around that's not enough we need to see it. So Captain Kirk is right. More people should go there. But there are different ways huh, to go to space. I remember that uh, what she gave me really to become an astronomer and to go to space was just to go uh, in the nature uh, by a very dark night and to see the dark sky. We are laying down on the on the on the ground and looking at the Milky Way, and really you could see we are on spaceship Earth. We are astronauts that give us so also uh, having a contact uh, with uh, nature to to uh, to see how we are part of it and also how we are part of the cosmos. Huh? You know, know uh, knowing also our origin in terms of uh, um, stardust and uh, we our destiny is to go back. Uh, uh, to space. So um, also being an astronaut on Earth and uh, looking what we can do by uh, uh, exploring that can further as well our destiny on Earth. 
And at some stage, yeah, being able to go in orbit, uh, yeah, then the end to be able to settle uh, in the nearest uh, planetary body that is the moon. That's something that, uh, yes, uh, uh, give us a chance uh, to go beyond. Yes, actually the knowledge is the problem. People know so little. I mean, I do people. I, I have a big, uh, of course, a telescope. That will advise you, I think. Um, uh, when I'm standing with that telescope, people will see it. They're coming to me with questions. I can't believe how do people make. Like, you, you're looking at the moon, you're looking at the stars. Maybe you can answer me something. I said, yeah, of course I can. You know, I wonder, why do the moon have a light? I mean, these kind of questions. And, uh, you know, I'm not... Uh, I'm not a football fan. Uh, I'm not against sport. People might like sport if they want, but I'm against the religious part of it. And I met one guy one time. He was, uh, he called himself as a football idiot, anyway. Funny guy, but he came to me and asked a question. He said, why do the moon have the light? It's the same reason for that football light. How about the football don't have a light? Said, of course the football have a light. That's the reflection. Oh, so uh, the knowledge here, the knowledge is so low. And that guy who write, write an extremely terrible review about my book, he don't believe that there's water in space. He don't believe there is anything out there like oxygen. We cannot breathe. Of course, we cannot breathe in space, but everything we have on Earth is coming from space. We are a part of space. Before the Earth exists, everything here, there, or it's out there still, but just in another form. Mm -hmm. the, the soon we plan. So the knowledge is the problem. It's really small knowledge. We have to do something with that. Yes. So it's Definitely. about culture. So not only culture, culture, yes, culture. You said it, yes, and and all type of culture we need. Huh? So uh, culture, exactly. uh, I mentioned that in my book. Yes, and culture that in my book. of minds, because uh, many people talking about we have to take care of our culture. I think you hear it from your country. I hear it in my country. It's so important to keep the culture. But some culture is destructive. Some culture is making us dumb, and and uh, we don't need to we don't need to try to protect the culture because if the generation after us like the culture, culture will be protected out of us. We need sometimes to renew. We, uh, we need to not renew. We need to make a new culture or something additional additional to the culture because of the additional knowledge. We have. Well, uh, so I think maybe we can uh, we can close this session. If the, okay. anything more to say, any anything more from our audience? So it was a, a beautiful uh, session, this one, and I loved very much to to talk with you, uh, Einar. And uh, uh, I think we will make it again uh, in, uh, in 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 the future. Nice to meet. Nice to meet Mother Earth. No. Yes, sure. <laughs> <laughs> please, yeah. please give give our greetings to her. I will. She's so happy. Okay. She's so happy. I tell you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Good. Yes. So long and so and welcome to our next uh, webinars and all the activities of uh, Space Renaissance uh, International. Uh, if you have been inspired, uh, then. Uh, also join us and uh, there's a lot to do, yes, to increase uh, uh, knowledge and uh, our culture in our way uh, to expand into space. See you okay. so long. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ad Astra. Ad Astra. Thank you.